on an old road Take a two-lane trip of memories Into mysteries unknown Come along for the ride Jim Hinckley's America Jim Hinckley's America Well, here you are, and there you are, and you did the right thing again. You made the right turn on the right road, and you're going right down the road, and you just turned the radio on. Have a good trip, and uh, you are in tune. You are in touch with the program just for you, because you like the Route 66, and you like the American automobile, so... Here we go. This is Jim Hinckley with Car Talk on the Main Street of America. Again, another adventure both into the history of the road and the history of the American automobile. And they both changed everything about the way we live, do our work, and travel today. So uh, Jim is ready with another story, another episode. So stay tuned. Uh, he'll be right here. I have a question. If you were asked to name five men or women that were instrumental in the launching of the American auto industry, who would be on that list? Henry Ford, David Buick, Walter Chrysler, Louis Chevrolet or William Durant? How about Horace and John Dodge? Would Morris Markin make that list? If you don't know who Morris Markin is, well, you are in the right place. This is Card Talk from the Main Street of America. I am Jim Hinckley, and every week I tell a bit about America's story on this program. I suppose that's why some folks call me America's Storyteller. Good morning, mi amigos. And Stan, how are you doing? Well, on today's episode of Card Talk from the Main Street of America, I will introduce you to the illustrious and mysterious Mr. Markin, and I will share a condensed version of the story behind the creation of an American icon, the Checker Cab. This is a twisted tale of corporate intrigue, shady characters, arson, embezzlement, unsolved mysteries, and unanswered questions. It's a story about innovation, and if not one, but two immigrants that went from rags to riches. Even though production of the Checker Cab came to an end in 1982, it is still recognized as a part of the urban American landscape. But the company did more than produce taxis. With Morris Markin in the driver's seat, the company profitably manufactured a diverse array of vehicles for niche markets. And with a unique program that allowed refurbished used vehicles to be sold internationally, Checker found a way to sell everything on the hog, including the squeal. In 1931, the company introduced the MU6 Suburban Utility, a nine-passenger station wagon that was promoted as a vehicle that easily converted into a hearse or package delivery truck. When the American Bantam Car Company invented and developed the original Jeep prototype, the company attempted to partner with Checker to ensure that they received the contract for production. Checker engineers took the idea one step further. They modified the original prototype into a four-wheel drive and four-wheel steering all-terrain vehicle. That prototype is on display today at the Gilmore Auto Museum Complex, Hickory Corners, Michigan, near Kalamazoo. Checker built trucks, trailers, buses, and six- and eight-door station wagons under the Aerobus name. And they were one of the first American companies to offer a diesel engine option in a passenger car. The foundation for one of the last of the truly independent automobile manufacturers was the obscure Deschamps Motor Syndicate of Buffalo, New York, manufacturer of the rather unusual Seven Little Buffalo automobile. As you may have guessed, that was a short-lived endeavor. Faced with insolvency, William Deschamps, the founder, announced that the company was being reorganized. Before the ink had dried on that, the arrangement, he fleeced new investors, moved the company to Ecorse, Michigan, and reorganized the company for the manufacture of the Suburban, 
That endeavor came to an end in 1912 with mis- charges of embezzlement. Dijon resigned and then was arrested. The company was reorganized as the Parton Palmer Motor Car Company with Randall Palmer, savior of the Carter Motor Car Company, at the helm. But the refusal of creditors to negotiate and sabotage of machinery doomed the company from the beginning. Palmer and the directors had good reason to suspect that it was Charles C. Darnell, regional sales manager in Chicago, and his partners, one of whom was the production manager at the factory, that were behind the sabotage. Those suspicions were given credence in 1915 when Darnell bought the company's assets for pennies on the dollar after the bankruptcy. Darnell relocated machinery to Chicago, Chicago, and he established the Commonwealth Motors Corporation. The hinge pin was the nickel-steel alloy frame of the Parton Palmer, one of the strongest in the industry. But sales were less than anemic, as the limited market was flooded with automobile manufacturers. So Darnell flirted with the idea of building a truck on that frame. But in 1915, John Hertz had established the Yellow Cab Company in Chicago specifically for the manufacture of taxis. That idea piqued Darnell's imagination. As an historic footnote, John Hertz, a Hungarian immigrant, also profitably pioneered development of another niche market with a rental car company that was the first to have offices nationally as well as internationally. Darnell relocated the company to Joliet, Illinois, and began manufacturing a second line of vehicles, Mogul Taxi. It was an assembled car that utilized purpose-built bodies supplied by Lomberg Auto Body Manufacturing Company. To conserve limited resources, production of the Commonwealth was shelved. To fill the order placed by Darnell, the Lomberg Company was reorganized, loans were acquired, and there was a massive expansion of facilities. But mogul sales never reached the level promised by Darnell. So for that company to remain solvent, Lomberg was forced to drastically cut its order. That had a domino effect, as this forced Lomberg to default on loans. In desperation, the company's founder, Abraham Lomberg, turned to fellow Russian immigrant Morris Markin for a financial bailout. Now, this is where the story starts to get really interesting. Markin had arrived penniless less than a decade prior, and he began working for his uncle, a tailor in Chicago. The duo made a small fortune when they were awarded a government contract to manufacture military pants. But where do they get the money to purchase a building to use as a factory and to outfit it with modern machinery? There was a swirling rumor in Chicago that Markin and his uncle also dabbled in enterprises that weren't exactly legal. And some of their rumored partners in those enterprises profited mightily with the enactment of prohibition. Those rumors would resurface a few years later when a literal taxi war erupted in Chicago between men like Bugs Moran, Dean O'Banion, and Frank Nitti. In exchange for a sizable loan to Lomberg, Markin was given a partnership in the company. When Commonwealth Motors Corporation collapsed, Lomborg and Martin Markin were left in a precarious financial position. Magnifying the problems was the post-World War I economic recession that led other automobile manufacturers to begin canceling contracts. Even a sizable order for mogul taxis placed by Checker Taxi Company, a consortium of independent operators in Chicago, could not save either company. In mid-1920, through a complicated series of loan restructuring initiatives, company reorganization, and arrangements made with new investors, Markin was able to gain controlling interest and reorganize Lomberg Auto Body Manufacturing Company into the Markin Body Company. He then offered shares of stock in the new company in exchange for the primary assets of Commonwealth that had entered receivership. In October 1921, receivers approved the offer and Markin quickly merged the two companies into the newly minted Checker Cab Manufacturing Company and initiated the sale of 25,000 preferred shares of stock. 
But the questionable appraisal of Lombard, key to the entire transaction, and subsequently the merger and sale of stock, sparked an investigation that later resulted in the indictment of Markin and the company's treasurer. An appeal that resulted in reversal and acquittal, linked with a questionable campaign donation, later played a role in an investigation pertaining to bribery and malfeasance that ended with a major political scandal in Illinois. The primary competitor was Hertz that built a fortune pioneering used car sales and development of a modern public transit system. He had devised a brilliant strategy to dominate the taxi business in Chicago. In addition to manufacturing taxis under the yellow cab name, he established a separate company that sold taxi franchises. Hertz also offered a financing arrangement and discounted interest on the loan in exchange for a percentage of profits. A third option offered was a percentage of the company to substitute as a down payment for yellow taxis. To protect his investment in taxi companies, each fleet operator that purchased yellow cab received a business operation manual, instruction manual for the vehicle, and discounted maintenance at a Hertz-owned garage. Sales of cars and franchises soared as Hertz expanded into Detroit, New York City, Los Angeles, San Francisco, Cleveland, and most major American cities. Further expansion came with establishment of Chicago Motor Coach Company, a pioneering city bus service in Chicago in 1917. By late 1920, the Checker Cab Company, under the direction of Michael Sokol, remained the last obstacle to complete dominance of the Chicago taxi industry by Hertz. I should have read by late 1921, excuse me. In 1919, Frank Dilger had initiated an effort to counter the Hertz monopoly with the establishment of Checker Cab Company in Oak Park, Illinois, and the purchase of mogul taxis. Unlike Yellow Cab Company, Checker was an association of independent owner-operators working under a single livery. During the initial months of operation, Checker Cab Manufacturing Company produced mogul taxis and passenger cars under the revised Commonwealth name. Emulating Hertz, Checker also special, offered special financial arrangements to operators working under the Checker Cab Company umbrella. Then, on June 18, 1922, Markin introduced the Checker Model C and streamlined operations to manufacture only this car. The in initial success of the Checker inspired Markin to seek larger facilities suitable for expansion of production. Additional incentive for relocation may have come with the violence on the streets of Chicago between factions of Checker Cab Company men and those operating under the Yellow Cab Company franchise and the firebombing of Morris Markin's home. Markin evaluated numerous manufacturing facilities, including the former Mitchell Motors factory in Racine, Wisconsin, and the Dort Auto Body Plant. He finally settled on the relatively modern Handley Knight factories in Kalamazoo, Michigan. As added incentive for relocation, the city of Kalamazoo offered to provide generous tax and zoning deferments. In addition to the Handley Knight facility, Markin initiated negotiations for the purchase of the 200,000 square foot Dort facility after an engineering evaluation deemed it one of the best equipped body manufacturing plants in the country. I seem to be a bit tongue-tied today. For that, I do apologize. The negotiations with James Handley for the purchase of production facilities, the adjoining heating plant, and more than 35 acres of land were as complicated, confusing, and shadowy as the ones in Illinois that had resulted in an investigation. Questionable and complicated business dealings would become a checker hallmark in the years before World War II. One of the more interesting was a limited partnership with E.L. Cord, the man who had revived Auburn, launched Cord in Duesenberg, and acquired an array of companies including Lycoming Engines, this chapter in the Checker story begins in 1919, when Charles McCullough began using Parmalee Transfer Company, the oldest taxi and cartridge company in Chicago, to
to dominate the urban public transportation market in numerous cities. He acquired controlling interest in Motor Cab Transportation Company of New York City and Transportation Management Corporation, a holding company with a lengthy list of subsidiaries that included the Yellow Taxi Company of Minneapolis, Deluxe Cab Company of Cleveland, Yellow Cab Company in Pittsburgh, and the Pittsburgh Transportation Company that operated buses in that city. The second chapter was a story published by the Associated Press on April 5th, 1929. Quote, Taxi cab operating interests to Chicago and New York are to join with the Checker Cab Manufacturing Corporation in the largest merger in the history of the business. According to plans revealed today, New York banking interests representing Checker Cab have arranged to acquire the Chicago Yellow Cab Company, the largest operator in that city, and the Parmalee Transfer Company. The cost of factory expansions, mergers, and acquisitions in the late 1920s had left Checker Cab Manufacturing Corporation in a poor financial position to deal with the constriction of credit and the decline in sales in the first years of the Great Depression. With the production facilities idle for most of 1932, the company and its various subsidiaries posted a loss of $821,000 for the year. Meanwhile, as Markin moved to consolidate dominance or control of the taxi industry through the building of cabs and acquisition of taxi franchises, John Roscoe moved to acquire controlling interest in Checker Cab Manufacturing Company. Roscoe was a swashbuckling investor. He was also the financial chair of DuPont and General Motors. Roscoe had quietly began acquiring stocks of shares in Checker Cab Manufacturing Company with the initial public sale of stock in 1928. Through the creation of an investment group that included Walter Reed, a major stockholder in Mack Trucks, and DuPont family members, Roscoe solidified his hold on Checker. His plans and vision were breathtaking in scope. After acquiring controlling interest in Checker, he planned on using the company's facilities to manufacture Checker taxis, as well as GM's yellow cab taxis that had been acquired from John Hertz. Engines, transmissions, and differentials would be manufactured by Mack in preparation for the launch of a new line of light-duty trucks. Largely a resultant of Cord's intervention, these plans were stillborn. In July of 1932, the Roscoe DuPont Group acquired control of the company, and in June 1933, at the meeting of company directors, a reduction in the number of board members from 11 to 7 received approval. On the heels of this decision, four board members voted for the removal of Morris Markin as president. Markin had prepared for this by acquiring options on large blocks of stock. The Roscoe Investment Group were betting that Markin did not have the $1 million needed to exercise those options and regain control of the company. They were correct. But the ace up Markin sleeve was a lucrative business relationship with E.L. Cord. In a limited partnership, Markin had begun using engines manufactured by Lycoming Manufacturing Company. This was a company controlled by Cord. These would be used in the Model M taxis and trucks that were introduced in 1932. Cord had been making inroads into the taxi and commercial limousine business with the manufacture of the Safety Cab by Auburn. To counter the attempts to control Checker by Raskob, Markin signed his options over to Cord, who immediately exercised them, reinstated Markin as president, and restructured the board of directors. With the acquisition of Checker Cab Manufacturing Company, Cord transferred the manufacturer of taxis built for Safety Cab Corporation to the Checker facilities in Kalamazoo, and Checker would build taxis continuing the use of Lycoming engines. An additional cost-saving measure was the utilization of body dies with slight adjustment for the Checker Model Y, which is almost identical to the Auburn Safety Cab. On May 8, 25, 1936, an announcement released by Cord stirred tremendous interest among Wall Street investors. 
It also attracted the attention of the Securities and Exchange Commission. The subject of the announcement was the creation of a pool of stock in Cord-owned companies and the Checker Cab Manufacturing Company for investing in the securities of taxi-related companies. However, the investment group also served to artificially inflate the shares of stock owned by Markin and Cord through fictitious trading. Rather than engage in costly litigation, legal representative for the two industrialists negotiated a cease and desist order and a consent decree, a document that did not admit to wrongdoing, but that did outline penalties for future violations. This SEC hearing marked the end of an era, at least concerning the swashbuckling corporate endeavors of taxicab manufacturers. Only a few independent manufacturers, such as Studebaker, Hudson, and Packard, and of course the big three, remained in the manuf- as the manufacturers of taxicabs and vehicles for use as taxis. However, except for Checker, these taxis were merely a sideline, an outlet for fleet sales that contribute to a company's bottom line. Well, how's that for a twisted tale of corporate intrigue? Perhaps in another program, I can share more about the fascinating story of Checker, America's taxi. So, what do I have in store for next week? Well, I'll be sharing the story of American Motors, another company that learned to profit by selling everything on the hog, including the squeal. At this juncture, I need to suggest that you become a subscriber so you never miss an episode of Car Talk from the Main Street of America. And if your business or community needs a promotional boost, we are looking for sponsors of this and others, other Jim Hinckley's America's programs. If you can't wait until next week's program for another story about America's love affair with the automobile on the road trip, check out our website, jimhinckleysamerica.com, for lots of automotive trivia and stories, road trip inspiration, and some shared adventures on the back roads of America. Oh, my goodness, Jim Hinckley, once again, you've done it. You've got me full of nostalgia, full of memories. I have to confess, yes, uh, I was up in New York City, and we hailed a cab, and it was a small little yellow Prius, and I understand the deal, but as I kind of put things together, I had some fond memories of what it was like to step into a real checker cab. But, Jim, that's the way the world is right now, so... uh, Tell us some good news. <laughs> oh, you know, there's all kinds of good news out there. You know, Checker is a great story about uh, rags to riches immigrants. Some of the uh, early days with Morris Martin are a little shady and questionable here and there, but the company was so innovative. The way that they sold uh, profitably the uh, niche yeah. market vehicles, and uh, it's, it's quite an interesting study about uh, – adapting to changing times well you sure made it attractive for me now i want to learn more yes (laughs) yes wonderful cars wonderful story john hurts that's a story we'll sell share for another day but he was a hungarian immigrant that uh, went from rags to riches oh my goodness uh, took, took advantage of the opportunities that america presents well, you know that's what you're right. It's a, it's about the uh, the uh, innovation, the the highway and the cars. It's actually telling a, a good deal of America's story. And someone just texted me that uh, you should celebrate Car Free Day today by not getting in your car. Well, I went for a walk already, but I need to drive my car, <laughs> so I celebrate yes. that. <laughs> yes, celebrate transportation. That's right. Okay, what's up now? Well, we've got a lot of things coming up uh, on uh, as far as celebrating Route 66 in cars. There's a great event here on Route 66 in Kingman, Arizona, coming up uh, October 14th and 15th. In fact, there's two of them to give you some incentive. October and 15th and Kingman is Kingman Route 66 Fest. It takes place at Lewis Kingman Park, and it's celebrating Route 66 cars, music, and local craft beer. And at the uh, same time, about a mile and a half away, downtown Kingman is Chillin' on Beale. Uh, it's a monthly event held on the third Saturday of every month, April through October. 
and it just focuses on cars. Uh, come downtown, park, cruise, enjoy the atmosphere, visit with friends, try out some of the eclectic shops and restaurants, listen to some good music. They usually get two to 300 cars every month downtown. And uh, this month, also the Art Hub, downtown Kingman is having a special gallery showing of art about road trips. And they also have on display some 1946 Harley Davidson motorcycles. So that should be a great weekend and incentive to get out on Route 66 and do a bit of travel. Make uh, sure you do that, people, if you can do that. <laughs> yes. Yeah, unfortunately, I won't be here, Stan. I'll be on the road. First time since 2019, I have a fall tour, and I'll be uh, speaking in Atlanta, Illinois, at the museum on the evening of the 18th, and at the Miles of Possibility Conference in Pontiac, Illinois, on uh, October 24th. And I'll keep everybody posted as we get closer to these dates and uh, have more details. All right. Now tell them how they can reach out, ask questions, make suggestions, uh, tell their own stories to you. Uh, how can they reach out uh, to the master storyteller of <laughs> the Mother Road? And, of course, <laughs> the wonderful invention of the American automobile. Well, you summed it up really well. You know, this story is about Route 66. It focuses on cars, the evolution of the auto industry. Basically, that is the stage, and we tell America's story here. And the best way to get a hold of me is through the website at jimhinkleysamerica.com. makes it straight and simple. And you'll find my travel schedule, and you'll find all kinds of road trip inspiration and uh, interesting stories. Well, thank you very much, and we look forward to next week. And uh, hopefully you're going to get my friends who will take us out, that wonderful gang called The Road Crew, who will do their deal as we think about uh, kind of making our way down to the week ahead of us. Good yes, for I'm you, up. Jim Hinckley. I'm Stan Houston, and this is the show that you need to make sure that you take the right turn to every week. That's right, it's Jim Hinckley, and it is the uh, Main Street of America. Car Talk on the Main Street of America. Recommend us to others, give us good reviews, and um, uh, keep in touch. And best and blessings for you, you know, drive safely, walk safely, and be good to your neighbor. Bye for now. Say hello to a new friend on an old road. Take a two-lane trip of memories into mysteries unknown. Come along for the ride. Jim Hinckley's America. Jim Hinckley's America.